Perfect love casts out fear. My thoughts on that verse coming up, as well as some crises going on in our world and what's love got to do with it, right? We're going to discuss worldly love versus God's love and how that looked in the early church. And it dawned on me. We talk about bread breakers. We've had several episodes, and nobody's ever actually mentioned what in the world this bread breakers thing is. So we're going to do that as well. So stick with us. Hey guys, and welcome to another exciting episode of Your Life, God's Word. Thanks for joining this time of relevant conversation and scriptural application, where we apply God's Word to the most important areas of life, God, family, and community. We pray this broadcast inspires, encourages, challenges, and blesses you in every way. So without further ado, let's dive right in to this week's episode. So it dawned on me that, you know, we've we've been doing this podcast. This is actually our eighth episode, and we've mentioned Bread Breakers, and, you know, check us out on breadbreakers.com and follow us and all this stuff, but we actually haven't ever told anybody that may not know yet, what what is Bread Breakers? What is this whole thing about? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'm so glad that you asked what Bread Breakers is. Uh, Bread Breakers is a... We are a church, and we are a ministry. Some people distinguish between the two. We don't really, so we use the word bread breakers interchangeably uh, often. But what we are is a ministry born out of looking at the early church, the book of Acts. When we look at the book of Acts and we see when the church was birthed, let's just get back to reading the Bible, what were they like? Let's try to be exactly like the early church. We draw our name Bread Breakers from Acts chapter 2. When you read through verses, say, 42 through 46, you see they broke bread, right? They went from house to house. We, we developed our name, Bread Breakers, because of that mentality. Now, the house to house mentality, we started uh, in homes. We started as a church uh, home group ministry. We now uh, have our, our, our first campus, if I can use that, <laughs> uh, loosely, loosely used. But we, we now have our, we have our first building. We've been in there uh, just, at this point, uh, just about 10 months. And God has been just pouring people in. We started you know, in a living room with you know, eight people uh, very quickly, you know, kind of 12, 14. It was funny because I was talking to somebody recently. I was like, man, a, a, a really packed out Sunday five years ago was like 14 people. Um, now, the growth that God has brought in, and we don't measure by just behinds and seats either. That, that's one thing that I, I, I think we can get caught up in. I don't think, it, I don't think it's very, very biblical. Now, you need, you need people in seats. You need people coming in. You need numbers to make disciples. But Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said he wanted people to go and make disciples, not just make church members. Um, if people want to come to Bread Breakers and never want to move forward, they don't want to really grow that much, they just want a nice, safe place for their family, we love them, we will care for them, we will give them an atmosphere of love, of the Spirit, and of truth where they can, they can do that. But we really focus and try to push folks, listen, let's be disciples like Jesus wanted to, or wanted us to. And so... What we really, um, what we really try to focus on is having a large percentage of people that are coming, that are also moving forward in their personal relationship and growth with God through prayer, fasting, in the Word for themselves, and connecting with the body to grow and develop in discipleship. Discipleship doesn't happen on a Sunday morning. Discipleship happens many times. Sunday morning is a, a small part of it, but. Where it really happens, what I've seen, what we've seen in our experience is in those small groups where you can ask questions, where you really get to fellowship and learn and grow and develop. So uh, that's that's kind of what we are. That's who we are. We like to help people. We do stuff uh, for and with folks that have uh, no connection with us. We've done some trips before, just going and doing presentations and things like that uh, to to church people who just want to learn and grow and develop. How, what are you doing? What's working? So we don't have a closed-minded uh 
kind of mindset. We are happy to help churches. We're happy to help uh, people, families that want to start something in their home or would like to be connected, but also do a group in their home, that kind of thing. So we're very, we're very big on just kingdom, kingdom of God. And uh, we push what we call the four pillars, Acts 2.42. Uh, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching, right, in fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. And we heavily stress those things, prayer, doctrine, word, teaching, learning, growth in that area, uh, fellowship, true, intimate connection with the body of Christ, and then doing life together, just really doing life together. I mean, you go on a fishing trip, you go, you go play some paintball, you go shopping, you, 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 you incorporate your church life with the rest of your life, because it is all just one life. We don't have a church life and another life and a work life, okay? Somebody that does that is uh, maybe not being holistic when they're looking at their life, which can be problematic. So that's kind of who and what we are. We will do a deeper dive on that in the future, I think, probably talking a little bit about our story and, and things of that nature. But I just wanted to give a quick rundown of that before we dive into some of these other things, which we're going to do right now. And the way I want to do that is to jump into a article, if I could pull this thing up. Here we go. So here's the thing. We've been on a series right now. I think this is probably going to be the last of the of the series. We've been on a series talking about love. Love is a amazing doctrine in the uh, New Testament church. It is doctrinal. It is uh, it permeates everything that we do. You can go back and watch the other two. Uh, or, well, you can't watch them. This is the first one that we're doing the podcast on YouTube as well. Yay for us. Um, but we, you can go listen to the podcasts uh, weeks six and seven, I believe. So what I want to do is make a contrast and show how the early church lived their love versus how the world views love. And and one thing that I that I found recently it's it's been pretty popular is there is this um there's this multicultural um center, right? A university here's the, here's the um here here's the headline I'm reading. University student in multicultural center says whites should leave. There's too many white people in here. So the, you can go check out the video for yourself. You can go read articles on it and draw, um, you can draw the conclusions uh, that, that you'd like to, but it's very, very apparent. This is a quote unquote multicultural center, right? So all cultures, right? Um, th this is uh, university of Virginia, I believe UVA. And uh, there's a video of this girl standing up and and basically saying, um, frankly, there is just too many white people in here, and this is a space for people of color. This, this, this is... But see, one thing that stems out of the world, they like to use the word love all the time. Like, oh, you know, just be loving, and they use, they use love as a door... Well, who wouldn't want love? And so they ram things down our throats. People ram stuff into law, cram it down people's throats and say it's loving. Um, it's not loving. It's totalitarianism. But what we need to understand is the world's understanding of love is skewed. It's wrong. Only God's love is pure and undefiled. We can go so far. I think people can do certain loving things. I'm not saying you you have to be a Christian to even be able to show love at all whatsoever. But eventually we'll get to a point where the world's love is is tainted. Okay? Now I have um I, I will give the benefit of the doubt and say I believe that the entire multicultural movement that it started from a good place. It started from, hey, let's have some more inclusion. Let's let's teach people about um, about other cultures. You know, let, let's not have, you know, kind of closed-mindedness. Let's let people grow up and understand we live in a world where we're all people, right? According to the scriptures, we're all image bearers of God. Every person has infinite value. It doesn't matter their background, their culture, their origin, their race. None of that matters. Each person 
in and of themselves, they are an image bearer of God. They, they have value, okay? Infinite value. And so, I mean, the Bible says if, if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul, what, what, what does it profit them, right? So we need to understand that people have infinite value. And I love the fact that I'm, I'm listening to a book right now that uh, talks about millennials. I happen to just barely squeak into the the millennial um, uh, the millennial classification by my my date of birth. Um, but so I'm one of them. Okay, so I'm listening to this book, and one thing that that keeps jumping out is that millennials uh, that many times they don't struggle like the a couple of the generations before us may have struggled a little bit, but but overcome and persevered and pushed through, not looking at people by racial lines or ethnic backgrounds. But you get to the millennials, and a lot of times they legitimately don't even look at it that way. Like asking them questions like interracial marriage. Like, what? What's that? Oh, you mean when, like, I marry this, you know, I, I'm Caucasian, I marry a uh, someone that's of Japanese descent? They don't even consider that like an issue. Oh, a Spanish person marries uh, a, a Spanish man, marries a black lady. They don't even, we don't, I mean, again, I, I just don't look at people in that way. I, I mean, I look at people as people. Now, I think that comes from a couple of things. One, my generation, but it comes from the fact that I am a Christian and I truly believe the Word of God. And the Word of God teaches that in the New Testament, there is neither Jew or Greek, bond or free, male or female. Right, these distinctions of culture and race and classification, even of gender, right, which we'll talk about in a second. The, these things, we are all people. Now, do we have different roles and responsibilities? Sure. Uh, it can, can you walk into Coca Cola as a Christian and be like, "Well, I just started day one. I'm over here, um, you know, cleaning the bathrooms, but we're all one, so I'm the CEO." No, that's not what the Bible's teaching. But the Bible's teaching in Christ. There should be, these distinctions should fade away, and we should all be able to love one another as family, as community, and we should be able to um, worship together and live our lives in this way. So I found that very interesting because, again, right, it may have started from a good place, but we've gotten to the place now where multiculturalism really is just institutionalized racism or institutionalized, just put the ism on there, okay? Okay. Um, people use multiculturalism to bash folks over the head, right? This whole thing that was going around a couple years ago about cultural appropriation. I mean, literally, right? If you had an office party and it's Tuesday and you said, hey, guys, we're going to have some fun. We're going to call it Taco Tuesday. We're going to dress up in like, you know, maybe Mexican garb or whatever. Just have a good time that people would like get angry. Like, you're not authentic Mexicans. How dare you do this cultural appropriation, what in the world are you talking about? Seriously? But this is where we've developed to because the world's idea of love and community gets tainted because we do not have the purity and truth mixed into it. We really do need the love of Christ to be able to break down these barriers. And that doesn't mean just because you go to church, you had the love of Christ. So uh, go and watch some of the other episodes and, and you'll, you'll, you'll get a little bit more on that. The other thing I want to I want to quickly talk about, and again, this is popular right now. You can go check it out for yourself. But uh, D Wade, right? Dwayne Wade, um, you know, coming coming out and and, and supporting his uh, his son, who now believes he is a a, a girl. Uh, I'm sorry, folks. When folks are 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, and they come to their parents, and they say. Hey, Dad, I'm no longer a boy. I'm a, I'm a girl. Um, my name is John, but I want you to start calling me Joan, and I want you to start using pronouns that more accurately um, reflect the way I feel and what I want to do. Right? I, I saw a little bit of an interview, and again, go, go check it out. You don't have to take all this stuff from my, um, from, from my perspective or take my word for it. Um, so... I watched this interview, and here we have Dwayne Wade say it's important for parents to be able to, you know, guide their children and help their children and all this. Then he proceeds to talk about how his little boy comes home 
and declares that he is now a girl. And there was no direction. There was no guidance. There was no, it was just, oh, wow, awesome. Thanks for letting me know. We're definitely going to just do that. Again, the world would, oh, what loving parents. No, that is straight up child abuse. Are you kidding me? What if your child came home and said, I am no longer a child. I'm no longer a human being. I am an alien from the planet Xenoron, and you are to start referring to, to me as Would you do that? Well, why not? Because if biology says this person's a boy, and we're now going to start treating them like a girl just because they feel like it, well, what if they came home and said, I feel like I'm a pterodactyl? And so I want you to build me a perch on top of the on top of the roof, and um, you know my food is now going to more more directly um, correspond with the diet of prehistoric times. And I mean, come on, really? And would you just be like, oh wow, wow, thank you, son. You you came out and finally you've recognized that you're really a dinosaur. Of course, most people would be a T Rex because they are still the coolest, right? Come on. Yeah, I know raptors are pretty cool. Um, you know, with the Jurassic Park movies, there's some 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 like hybrid, you know, breeds coming out. But I'm I'm sorry. The T-Rex is still the coolest dinosaur. All right, my son definitely agrees, so there you go. I mean, the two of us have declared that and so it is let it be written. No, how's it go? So let it be written. So let it be done. Right? Yul Brenner, of course, can do that way better than me. However, come on, folks. <clears throat> Think about this. Think about what we're doing in our society. You feel it, and therefore it is so. But what would we use to push this? Oh, look at the love. No. No, I'm sorry. That's not love, okay? That is not love. That is permissiveness, okay? And a lot of the what the world does, and even if it creeps into the church, is it's not love, it's licentiousness. It's not love, it's permissiveness. It's not love, it's uh, uh, being afraid to stand up for truth, right? The Bible says speaking the truth in love, what we do is we just speak love. But that's not real love, <laughs> okay? Real love is bound up in truth. If I love you, I should love you enough to tell the truth about something. You, there's a glaring problem here, but I love you so much, so I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to let you continue on with this. Does the loving doctor come in and tell their patient everything's good to go. They're looking at the results. They have cancer. They need to do drastic, radical changes. We think we've caught this in time, but it's going to require you to really sacrifice and really, your life's going to hurt. Is it more loving to come in and say, nah, everything's good. You know, keep doing what you're doing. No, not, a, I mean, who would say that, right? But I guess in today's world, they could just say, well, you have cancer. They say, well, I feel like I don't. Okay, good. I guess you don't. I mean, see, feeling is not reality. It's ridiculous. But, oh, are you're not loving. Uh, no, let's get to the bot. Why do you feel that way? Do you know what Dwayne Wade should have done? Okay, talk to me, son. Why, why do you feel this way? Uh, what is it that makes you think you feel like a girl? What does that mean to feel like a girl? What do you mean you feel like a girl? What does that mean? See, instead of asking these kinds of questions and probing and finding out, I mean, who knows? Maybe they're getting bullied. Maybe, maybe there's pressures mm -hmm, from the others uh, I'm not going to get into, right? Their lifestyle, the crowds they hang around, okay, they push this stuff. You're going to tell me that has nothing to do with it? Come on, ridiculous. Why not ask these questions? Why not find out and get to the bottom of it? Instead, you just affirm that what they say, and that's love. I'm sorry, that is not love. It is worldly love, but that is not true love. So, so what's the point, right, right? Worldly love, the world can't get love right. Okay, it can't get love right. Remember way back, I mean, I don't remember, I have to go back and look at history and stuff, but uh, way back, or otherwise I wouldn't be a, a millennial, uh, way back, right, the hippie movement, what do they call, what do they say? Free love, right? Peace and love. Um, and their free love, I believe, you look at history, their free love led to a whole bunch of single moms, led to a whole bunch of abortion, led to a whole bunch of STDs led to a whole bunch of problems. Remember, they were about peace, too. And, and when you go back and look at that time in history, right, you had, you had uprisings, you had riots, you had bombings, 
Oh yeah, that's real peaceful. But you see how the world just can't get this stuff right. The world can't get this stuff right. Why? Because it's coming from, at best, it's coming from the human nature, which is sinful. Okay? You don't believe it? I don't believe in sin. Okay. Human nature is not refined. Human nature is not naturally loving, right? If you're just human nature, right, it's survival of the fittest. The natural is, if it makes sense for me to kill you, kill all y'all, take all your stuff, and me to survive, so be it. That's raw human nature. The love of Christ is a far different thing. We have to be careful. Uh, Hear me, Christians, please. We're coming into a, a time of of political noise. We're coming into a time where the world is going to tell us who they think we should vote for, who should lead this country. Now, as Christians, please, 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 please put your priorities according to the Word of God. Uh, The Bible does not dictate. God does not specifically say, capitalism is my way, okay, or socialism is the way to go. So we can have economic differences, differences in finance and things like that, tax policy, but can we all agree that murdering unborn babies, God's probably not cool with that. So whoever you vote for, could we at least say, well, if they're for that, I'm not going to be for that. Other things that are clearly immoral, right? Jesus said, male and female created he them, right? People that will destroy that truth. I mean, Jesus apparently thought it was important enough to to mention it. The scriptures clearly show and teach that. And this is a serious moral issue and problem in our day, right? You can try to make taxes moral, um... I think there's I think there's an argument, I believe there's an argument to be made if you're taxing people to redistribute, I believe that is institute it can be, okay? I, again, it can be institutionalized covetousness, institutionalized thievery, stealing, right? We we want what that person has, and so instead of us going with a gun to get it, we're gonna send somebody else with a gun to get it. And now, <laughs> okay. I'm not against taxes. I think there's definitely, a and, and even Jesus, what did he say? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render to God the things that are God's. He did not come out and say taxes are immoral, okay? So I don't think taxes are immoral. But murdering babies is immoral. And breaking down the family structure that God created is immoral. And so as Christians, we should first eliminate the playing field from that nonsense, and then let's discuss our differences about tax policy and economics and tariffs and these types of things. Could we possibly do that? That would be an amazing thing in this election, but unfortunately, lots of Christians do not do that. They go and they pull the lever because they love, I guess, and push some of the most wicked agendas that we could ever possibly come up with. So what am I saying? The world knows how to manipulate the thoughts that come up when we think love. They know how to manipulate the wording. They know how to, under the guise of love, push whatever agenda they want. The church should be aware of what real love is, and we should be able to vote, to live, to operate in God's love, in true love. So when we when we when we look at the early church, what does that look like? What does it look like? Um, I'm going to dive into a little bit of scripture here, Galatians chapter 3, 26 through 29. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise, right? 
American racism today has nothing. All right, American socioeconomic division has nothing. Gender inequality, right? All these things have nothing on what they, the society they were in. They had legitimate slaves, okay? They had legitimate, okay, racial divide. I mean, Jews were raised—I mean, look at the scriptures, right? It's not, it's not good to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. They, I mean, they, they, they were looking at the Gentiles as dogs. I mean, they did not associate with them, and then the church comes along and says, nope, all that stuff needs to be washed away. We need to join as one in Christ. That is actually a very revolutionary <laughs> idea in the early church, and even today, right? Martin Luther King's dream of all of us coming together Right, the only way it's going to really ever happen. We've had a, we've had our first black president. We we have we have people of pretty much all races, right, in all levels of government and all levels of business. Are we all now coming together singing Kumbaya? No. You know why? Because the only way that's going to happen, the places in history where that's really truly happened for real, is in the church. And that is because the love of Christ is what's there, not some worldly love that we derive from other means. Okay? I find it very interesting. I, I, uh, we, we, we actually talked about this a little bit this past Sunday. And 1 John 5, 4, very popular scripture, right? The, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, right? But before you get to verse 4 of 1 John, 1 John 5, 1, opens up with everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him, right? He opens up leading in with love, and then that morphs and goes into those born of God overcome the world, and it's the faith that overcomes the world. Of course, we know uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, right? Faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. So think about this. Just a thought. I want to plant this. If faith can overcome the world, and love is greater than faith, what could love do? You know, we can overcome, we can strive, we can persevere, but maybe if we can, I'll just say, if we can get beyond just faith that overcomes and also have love like they did in the early church, maybe we wouldn't just have to overcome, maybe we could win the world. And then we're all one in Christ. Wouldn't that be an, an just incredible? Wouldn't that just be absolutely amazing? What a world to live in that would be. But not everyone would, would think so necessarily, right? When you think about it, oh, wow, that sounds amazing. You've got all this incredible stuff happening. But, see, the early church, love in action was not the kind of love that some people envision that churches should be. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go and, and, and dive, into, dive into the Scriptures. Romans 14, 1 through 3. Accept him whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. See, I believe, again... When you look at the scriptures, I believe there are things you can draw out from there that are, I call them non-negotiables. These are the things that define what a true church is. They are non-negotiable. But there are things that are negotiable, disputable matters. Things that coming into the kingdom of God, sitting right next to a brother or sister, right there in the same con local congregation, you could see things differently. I I don't I don't see any any problem with that. And in fact, the scriptures teach that. Romans 14:2 One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. This is also reiterated in when we go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 
Colossians chapter 2. There are different places where, I mean, people would might keep a certain holy day. They came in, they got freedom in Christ, but they, they want to continue to keep the Sabbath, or they want to continue to honor this thing or that thing, or, or, or abide by this rule that is, it's not the gospel. We have freedom in Christ, but they still, they still are going to hold to it. And what is the attitude that Paul is saying in Romans and in these other places that we should have? Okay? If we're not talking to non-negotiables, oh, you know, I just feel like, you know, we as a church just really need to stop harping on Jesus so much. Okay, that, that's kind of non-negotiable. Jesus made it very clear, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? Nobody comes to God but through me. You're not going to make it to the Father through, without coming through Jesus Christ. He is the way. So I would say <clears throat> maybe that's um, hmm, non-negotiable. There are other non-negotiables in these scriptures, and we can certainly dive into some of those at another time, but right now I'm talking about the negotiables. The negotiables, the negotiables are places where we just need to let love, true love, be the thing that guides us. What does he mean? The tendency to humans right, is to try and force everybody to be like us. So, you know, when we get into a church atmosphere, a lot of times churches will go one extreme or the other. One man's faith allows him to eat, the other one doesn't. Great, okay. The man who eats must not look down on him who doesn't. The man who does not must not condemn the one who does. So here, here is the... Here is the dichotomy that we must explore. We have a maybe a conviction, and it could even be from God. Okay, this is the thing. I mean, God can definitely move on someone, right? When you're developing an atmosphere where people are led by the Spirit, they're in the Word, they love one another, you're going to have people that have differences, and differences sometimes that truly came from God. Like somebody has a problem, they were an alcoholic, they come in, they're delivered, and, and, and not just it's, it's maybe good form, or they've decided this is probably a, be, a good thing for me. They've felt from God, you are never to touch alcohol again. Not a sip, not a, right? Um, that's maybe even go as far as to say you are not to go to places. If there is an open bar there, right, a, a, an Applebee's where there's a bar, right, in the restaurant. You were not to go there, right? Well, me, I, I've never been an alcoholic, and I don't, I, I don't have a, a word from God saying don't go to, go, don't go to Chili's. Um, but if I know that about my brother, A, I shouldn't be like, oh, come on, man, we're free in Christ. You need to just give that stuff up. That is wrong, according to the scriptures. The second thing I shouldn't do is I sh if I'm going out to eat to Applebee's, either A, don't invite them, or B, go somewhere else knowing that they've got an issue with Applebee's. This is all taught in the Scriptures. Go read 1 Corinthians 8, Colossians 2, Romans 14. You'll get a real good picture of that in those places. The other side of it is, well, I don't do that. Therefore, you shouldn't do that either. And this is a lot of times what happens in, you know, the churches, you know, sometimes people call them, you know, holiness churches. And, and it's so bad that something so wonderful like holiness, which is where we're, right, we're sanctified by God, set apart unto Him, gets turned into that word in many, in many people's minds means a church with a whole bunch of rules and regulations. And I'm just going to go through a couple. I know people, okay? I haven't been in a, in a church atmosphere nearly as strict as this, but I know people that you couldn't even wear a colored shirt. If you come to the church, you need, let's say you're a man, you walk in, it needs to be a white dress shirt. Anything else is worldly. You're wrong. Whoa. <laughs> I mean, you talk about <clears throat> you, uh, yeah, <laughs> la, 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 let's just stop right there, right? The, the level of detail that people will get into with people's lives, telling them where to go, how to dress, who to hang out with, 
Now, there might actually be some good things to say. I'll give you an example. I go to the theater, but would I drop my 14-year-old kid off at the theater on a, on a Friday night? No, probably not. Should I now go and preach to people that it's wrong to drop your teenage children off at the theater on a Friday night? You see the difference? I could certainly talk about the dangers. I could certainly say, hey, listen, parents, we need to be, you know, knowing what our kids are doing. We need to be more involved. We need to, I mean, we could we could go to uh, statistics and show things like this is not wise. But to to go the step of getting up and telling people like this, this is scriptural, this is wrong. One thing I, I, I listened to recently, because I was in a conversation with someone and then I went and checked it out on YouTube. And uh, uh, there is, um, you know, a huge debate over whether beards are an issue in the church. I don't even know why this is a thing, but it is. There are some people that teach facial hair is wrong. Not like, you know, I just, you know, for, for, for our look, for our church, you know, hey, if you're up on the platform, we really prefer, you know, that you not have a beard or whatever. Okay, I, I don't do that, but I, I think... Again, that that's one way to handle it versus trying to preach that it's wrong to have a beard, right? They plucked Jesus's beard. Did he grow that overnight? I mean, there in the Old Testament, it was a shame to have your beard like, you know, when the guys get half their beard shaved off or whatever. They clearly had beards. You know, the scripture in Psalm um you know, how good and pleasant it is for, for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the, the oil that runs down, you know, uh, Aaron's, you know, into his beard. Because he had a beard. I mean, I just... Anyway, so I'm watching this, and, the, you know, and, and I've heard, actually, there's people that teach on the other side that, no, you actually have to have a beard. Like, it's not godly to not have a beard. Like, what is wrong with people? I'll tell you what's wrong. They can't live by these scriptures. Maybe they feel like every man should have a beard. Great. You have a beard, and then you can say, well, my opinion is men should be, they should have beards. But don't try to preach people into hell and be dogmatic about you got to have a beard. And on the other side, well, you know, back in the day, the hippie, the beatniks, most people today have to go look up that word. They don't Woodstock. They kind, what, wasn't that like a big event that happened? Guys, ladies, and gentlemen. We are how many years away from Woodstock? I mean, when you're five decades away from something and you're still going, you know, we should, that identifies with this crowd, you are teaching nonsense. And what, what happens <clears throat> is you pervert the Word of God. Because now when you go and you teach something that is legitimate, people are going to be questioning when they shouldn't need to, Okay. Let's study 1 Corinthians 8, Colossians 2, Romans 14. That will give us this, we can agree to disagree. We can agree to disagree on some stuff. I love my brother. He doesn't feel he can do this. I honor him. I honor his walk with God. And I love him. Now let's join up and go do this thing. Let's, let's be kingdom together. Let's be family of God together. My brother does this, and I feel like... It, it's not that great, but it's there's nowhere in Scripture that says this is a problem. I just, that's my preference. That's how I was raised. You know what? I can agree to disagree. I love my brother. I honor their walk with God. I know that is a praying man. I know this sister over here. I mean, she is a praying woman. She abides by the principles of the kingdom of God. She's loving Jesus. She's out there. Let's just join up and agree to disagree on some stuff, folks. Why is it that the early church could do this, but many of our churches can't? I'll tell you why. They had the love of Christ, and many of our churches are devoid of it. That's why. We need to get back to some real love of Jesus Christ. Now, does this, um, you know, you had religious Jews already said, you know, pagans coming together, rich and poor. You know, Rome, those areas, you know, it, it wasn't like today. I mean, you literally had these really wealthy, rich people, and they just looked down on I mean, and many times you weren't getting, it wasn't like you can just work hard like in the United States of America. You, 
you, you, you couldn't just like work hard, come up with an idea, patent it. And man, now you went from, you know, pension pennies to you're a, you're a multimillionaire. Uh, it wasn't like that in that society. Okay. And yet poor and rich could come together and worship God together. Beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. They shared life together at tables and living rooms and in, in, in church settings, in, in the in the public forum and squares. I mean, they they really shared life and loved one another. So back to the beginning where we talked about uh, bread breakers, right? This is OG bread breakers. This, this is the original bread breakers. We are not unique, and in no way, shape, or form do I think, oh, we've got this new new idea, this thing that, woo. No, this is really this is so new. This is so old. It's new. It's such an old concept that it's dusty and dingy and off in the in the closet somewhere, and we've gotten it out, and now it seems like a whole new thing. It's not a new thing, okay? It's not a new thing. So the question becomes now, and here we go, <laughs> does this mean that love is permissive, right? That the early churches, they didn't deal with things, you know, they were just very, n- no. No. John 5, 14 and 15, right? Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you're well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. This is the healing of the pool of Bethesda. Jesus was pretty straight up. Quit your sinning. So first, he's calling out the fact this guy is a sinner, and he tells him to quit. Whoa, how dare you? Where's the love? Well, like I said, when you see a problem and an issue, speaking the truth in love, that should be the thing the church does. Truth in love. Second Timothy 4 and 2, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. He didn't say don't do these things, he said do them, <laughs> okay? Second, uh, second, huh? Titus 2.15, same thing. Encourage and rebuke. The early church didn't have a problem with this because they could do it in love. They developed that rapport. They were with one another. They were community. They were family. They were loving. And so when somebody had to get that rebuke, when somebody had to be admonished, they knew it was coming from a place of love. Now, they may reject it, but it's coming from a place of love. And that's really the important thing, right? The love, speaking the truth in love love. It's not that we don't speak the truth, it's in love. When when Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 says, hey, boot this guy out of the church, you guys are puffed up, there's sexual sin going on here, was he unloving when he did that? No. No. But he did this as a an apostle, as a matter of church government. Now, is everybody called to that role? No, right? So if you're not in that role, you're not called to that role, you shouldn't worry about it, just come to church with those blinders on and love Jesus and love others. But he was still in love, it just, he spoke the truth in love, this needs to happen, right? And so, you know, in the last couple of minutes here, I want to I want to go to uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no love in, no, there's no love in fear. <laughs> well, I guess maybe that kind of could go the same. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, there's a lot of lot of different things in here to extract and talk about, but let's see. I want to just go through one aspect of this. What about people who fear that God can't do his job? God, God needs me or you. He needs us to be his judge, jury, and executioner. He needs us to be his enforcer. We need to push the scriptures further than what they say, okay? We need to add to the Word of God, right? God has things in the Bible where He clearly gives His His preference. Here's some things that I, you know, I would like I would like to see in people, but He doesn't say or else or you're going to burn or whatever. And then, well, we we know it's good, we know it's right, and so we're going to go ahead and tell people, yeah, or you're going to burn. That that really is not the way to do it. That's adding to the Word of God, right? This is the problem with the Galatian church trying to add to the gospel. So. We don't need to crack down for God, crack down on His behalf. Let the Word of God speak for itself. The fear that God can't work with somebody, the fear that, but if I don't tell them that's wrong, there's this road, this path they could go down, and it could end up bad for them and their family, 
But you and I don't have the authority to go beyond the Word of God. We don't have the right to establish rules and regulations that are essential for people for people to live for God. Now, again, there's nothing wrong. I said it before. I disagree with the don't have beards on the platform, but it, it, so I can respect someone that says, look, this is not a uh, a, a scriptural precedent. This is not a, a scriptural command, but this is how we see it here. We just would prefer that people be clean shaven. Hey, if, 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 if restaurants can have standards, and I, I think, is it still... Is it still a thing where the New York Yankees don't let people have facial hair? I mean, if, if they can do that, I mean, a church can can certainly do that if they want to. Hey, if you're going to be in leadership here, we prefer this, we like this, but don't make it a, well, but you're going to, yeah, you can't even be saved if you don't do this. This is the problem. The other side of that is fear that God can't do his job, and so we got to soften it up. We've got to make things more palatable. You know, that was just for that time. That was just for that region, even though the scriptures don't say that. That was just, oh, that was just, you know, because their understanding of this, that, and the other thing that wasn't full. But now we know through medical science, or now we know, because, of course, we're way more enlightened than them. Um, you know, that was a regional thing. That was just for Ephesus. That was only for Colossae. That was just for Corinth. When the scriptures don't say that, what are we doing? In both of these situations, we're putting ourselves in the place of God. We are taking what God said, and we're saying, well, that's not good enough. We need to go a little, a little beyond that. We have put ourselves in grave danger. And so I would say, let's just have love and trust God. Let's not be lazy and do the work of, here's a list of rules and, and regulations, and follow this, and everybody looks like they're on the same page. To me, that's lazy. It's much harder to push and teach and train people to be in relationship with God for themselves, to have a personal prayer life, to be in the Word for themselves. That's more work on the front end, and it's more work on the back end, because then you're going to have people that are hearing from God for themselves, and they're going to come discuss things with you. They are hearing from God for themselves. They're looking at the Scriptures, and they're, well, well, you said this on, on last Wednesday night, but I was reading the Word, and it says this, because you sit down and explain this to me. That takes more work, and so a lot of people just don't want to deal with it. Just listen to what pastor says, or bishop says, or apostle says, or uh, prophet says, or whatever the, the whatever the head person is in your specific organization, your role, your church, whatever the head person says, the elder, whatever they say, that's what goes. No, let's open the scriptures, let's train people to be saints of the Most High God. That takes love, though. We love them, and we want them to be in that position, and I would say that that love will cast out the fear that God can't do his job. God certainly can. We need to do ours, and we need to teach the word. We need to preach the word. We need, Yes, we need to admonish, exhort. We need to rebuke when necessary, but it all needs to stem from love. It all needs to come from a love for God and a love for his body, a love for the kingdom, a love for our community of believers. Speaking of love, I love you. I hope this podcast has helped you. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Catch us on Facebook, on Periscope, on Twitter, breadbreakers.com. Love you. God bless. And we'll catch you on the next episode.